In question two, part A, we're given a simultaneous equation involving complex numbers. We're told that i times z1 is equal to minus four plus three i, and that three times z1 minus z2 is equal to 11 plus 17 i. You should look at the first equation and realize that there's only one unknown there. I can simply, I can just simplify the first equation and get z1 on its own. That's what I've done here. And then once I have z1 on its own, you sub it into the other equation and you find z2. So I took the first equation here and in order to get z1 on its own, I first divide everything by i. And I get z1 equals minus four plus three i over i. Now, to explore how to eliminate this, if you're, if you're not 100% on the theory on this, you can find it in complex numbers three on the website. But basically, when I get to this stage, when I have z1 is equal to minus four plus three i over i, you have to identify the problem is there's an i in the bottom of a fraction. If you have an i in the bottom of a fraction, in order to get rid of the complex, the imaginary number on the bottom of the fraction, you multiply the top and the bottom by i. Because if I multiply the bottom by i, it'll become i squared and eventually it'll become minus one. So if I multiply the bottom by i, there'll be no more imaginary number on the bottom. And that's the whole point to this. If you're multiplying the bottom by i, you must also multiply the top by i. So if I multiply the top by i, I get minus four plus three i times i. And on the bottom is the key, i by i becomes i squared. When you multiply at the top, i by minus four is minus four i. i by three i is three i squared. And then I know that i squared is equal to minus one. So the whole point of what I'm after doing there is to get rid of the i on the bottom of the fraction. So the bottom becomes minus one and the three i squared becomes three times minus one. When I simplify it down, I get minus four i minus three over minus one. A minus divided by minus is a plus. So ultimately I end up with z1 is equal to plus four i plus three. Now that I have a value for z1, I'm gonna sub it into the second equation here and I'll get a, a, a value for z2. So from here, it's basic enough. I know I now take the second equation and instead of z1, I can sub in three plus four i. So I subbed it in and then three times that gives me nine plus 12 i. At this stage, I just decided to move everything to the right hand side, except for the, the minus z2. And then the right hand side simplifies down to two plus five i. But obviously I don't want minus z2, so I change all of my signs. And my answer for z2, it's equal to minus two minus five i. So z1 is three plus four i and z2 is this. In question two, part b, we're given a geometric series. We're told that the first term in the geometric series is three plus two i, and the second term is five minus i. And we're asked to, to find the common ratio for the geometric series. The theory behind what we're about to do here can be found in complex numbers three and in sequences in series five. So we're amalgamating two different topics here. You need to remember from your sequences in series five that to the common ratio of a geometric series is any term divided by the previous term. For example, the second term divided by the first term. I know the second term in this series is five minus i, and the first term in this series is three plus two i. And now you need to remember from your complex numbers three that you are not allowed to have an i on the bottom of a fraction, just like we looked at in part a. If there are two terms, three plus two i on the bottom of the fraction, in order to eliminate the imaginary number this time, I need to multiply the bottom by its conjugate. If I multiply three plus two i by its conjugate, then there'll be no more imaginary numbers on the bottom. So I want to multiply the bottom of this fraction by three minus two i. When I multiply a double brackets, three plus two i by three minus two i, the imaginary numbers will be gone. I'll have, a, I'll have a real number. But I can't just randomly multiply the bottom of the fraction by the conjugate of the bottom. If I'm gonna multiply the bottom of the fraction by this, I must also multiply the top of the fraction by the same thing. Because if I multiply by the same thing on the top and the bottom, it's equivalent to multiplying by one, and I don't change the value of the expression. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simply multiply out the top, multiply out the bottom, and get the, my common ratio simplified fully. So the maths here is basic enough. On the top of the fraction, I have to multiply 5 minus i by 3 minus 2i. And when you multiply it out, you should end up with 13 minus 13i. On the bottom of the fraction, you have to multiply 3 plus 2i by 3 minus 2i. 
you multiply that one out and you get 13. If I amalgamate the top and the bottom now, the common ratio, the top is 13 minus 13i, the bottom is simply 13. Obviously 13 divides into itself once and 13 divides into minus 13i minus 1i times. So the common ratio for this geometric series is 1 minus 1i. Now B part 2 is very involved and really requires a good understanding of both of the topics. The theory we're going to explore in this solution comes from the video on sequences in series 7 and the video on complex numbers 12. We are told, we're asked to find the ninth term in this geometric series using De Moivre's theorem. So let's just explore this. The first thing I want to talk to you about is the theory that we know from sequences in series 7. In sequences in series 7, we explored how the first term in any geometric series is always referred to as A. In this case, I actually know from B part 1 that A, the first term is 3 plus 2i. And then to get to the second term, you simply multiply it by the common ratio. So the second term is A or to the power of 1. To get to the next term, you multiply by the common ratio again. So you take the second term and you multiply it by or. If I take a or and I multiply it by or, I get a or squared. The fourth term in a geometric series is a or to the power of 3. The fifth term, a or to the power of 4, a or to the power of 5, and 6, and so on. Notice that if I'm in the fourth term, the power of or is 3. If I'm in the third term, the power of or is 2. And the question is asking me for the ninth term, which means the power of or is 8. If you're not 100% on that, go back to the tutorial on sequences in series 7. I know that in a geometric series, the ninth term is simply the first term a multiplied by or to the power of 8. And I know from b part 1 that a, the first term in this geometric series, is 3 plus 2i and that or, the common ratio, is 1 minus 1i. So the ninth term is 3 plus 2i times 1 minus 1i to the power of 8. Now, this is where I need to stop thinking about sequences and series and start thinking about complex numbers. The question says to use De Moivre's theorem to work this out. Like, it is possible here to multiply 1 minus 1i by itself 8 times and then multiply that by 3 plus 2i and that would give me the answer. It would be really, really tricky and really, really long. But the easiest way to multiply 1 minus 1i by itself 8 times, the easiest way to solve that is to use De Moivre's theorem. And we weren't actually given a choice because it says use De Moivre's theorem here. So I'm going to use De Moivre's theorem to get 1 minus 1i to the power of 8. And for the moment, I'm going to ignore the rest of it. So we're going to come back to this line at the end. But for the moment, I don't care about any of the sequences and series logic. I'm only thinking about complex numbers. And I'm thinking about how can I get this to the power of 8. I, if, in order to use the Moivre's theorem, we first have to write the complex number in polar form. Polar form is when you write a complex number in the form or cos theta plus i sine theta. The last six, seven videos on complex numbers on the website are all related to get is to polar form. So go back and go back to the first one. The first video on the website about, about De Moivre's theorem will explain what we're about to do fully. Remember that or refers to the modulus. And we have a formula for the modulus. It's the square root of a squared plus b squared where a refers to the real number and b refers to the coefficient of i. So in this scenario, a will simply be 1 squared and b will be minus 1 to be squared, which if I simplify fully is the square root of 2. So or the modulus of 1 minus 1i is actually the square root of 2. Now the trickier thing here is to work out theta, the argument. The argument is the angle that the complex number makes with the positive sense of the x-axis. And in order to work out the argument, the easiest thing to do is to sketch an argand diagram, where the horizontal line represents the real axis, the vertical line represents the imaginary axis. I want to plot the complex number 1 minus 1i. So the real value in this scenario is 1, 
the imaginary value in this scenario is minus one. Again, it's only a rough diagram, it doesn't need to be accurate. But if I'm plotting the complex number, I'm gonna say it's there. It's one minus one i, it's there. Now, in order to get the argument, I need to form a right angle triangle. So I'm gonna join the complex number to the origin, and then I'm gonna join the complex number to the horizontal real axis. And theta refers to the angle the complex number makes the positive sense of the x-axis. Think back to all the work we did on the unit circle. You start at the real axis and you go in this direction. So I'm looking for this, I'm looking for, this is gonna be my theta, this huge angle here. It's clearly nearly a full revolution, but in order to work out what theta is, I first need to work out what this angle A is. So I want you to view this right angle triangle. I'm looking for the angle A. I know that the distance from the complex number to the real axis is one. It's the distance from zero to minus one. That distance is simply one. And I know that the distance from the origin to this point on the axis, it's also one. In other words, if you look at this right angle triangle and you take A, I know the opposite distance is one, the adjacent distance is one. The tan of the angle of an angle in a right angle triangle is opposite over adjacent. In this scenario, the opposite is one, the adjacent is one. So now you can do this in degrees or you can do this in radians. I'm inclined here to do this in degrees. If I know that tan A is equal to one, to get A on its own, I can read it off page 13 in my maths tables, or I can simply get tan inverse of one. Tan inverse of one, if you plug it into your calculator, works out as 45 degrees. So based on this little sketch here and this work, I can now deduce that this angle here is 45 degrees. That's not the angle that I'm actually looking for. I'm looking for the angle theta. Theta is the angle that the complex number makes with the positive sense of the real axis. Think back to what we did in the unit circle. This is a value in the fourth quadrant. To work out theta here, it's 360 minus 45 degrees. 360 minus 45 degrees gives me 315 degrees. So that tells me that in this case, theta is equal to 315 degrees. So all of the work I did getting or getting the argument, it's now gonna allow me to write one minus one i in polar form. So let me just wipe this off and tidy it up a little bit. So obviously there, I now know my argument, I now know my modulus. The whole point of this was to try and convert one minus one i into polar form. Polar form is always or times cos theta plus i sine theta. I know or is the square root of two, and I've now deduced that theta is 315 degrees. So it's or cos theta plus i times the sine of theta. I can now say that this complex number in polar form can be written like that. And what I need to do is get the complex number to the power of eight, which means I need to get all of this to the power of eight. And it's only at this stage that I can use De Moivre's theorem. De Moivre's theorem is incredibly easy to use. If I want a complex number in polar form to a power, it's really, really straightforward. First of all, you take the modulus and you get it to the power. So it's root two to the power of eight. And then you simply multiply the power by the angle. So instead of cos 315, it's gonna be the cos of 315 multiplied by eight. Same thing with the other one. Instead of i times the sine of 315, it's 315 multiplied by eight. And now all I need to do is plug all of this into my calculator and I'll simplify it down and I'll get one minus one i to the power of eight. So I've plugged in a few lines of calculator work here to finish it off. Root two to the power of eight is 16. 315 multiplied by eight is 2,520. The cos of that angle is one, the sine of that angle is zero. So I end up with 16 times one, which simply gives me 16. So I've used the Moivre's theorem to deduce that one minus one i multiplied by itself eight times is 16. And now that now we can completely ignore complex numbers and let's put on our sequences and series thinking caps. At the very, very start of this question, we referred to the fact that the ninth term in a geometric series 
is a multiplied by r to the power of 8. I know from b part 1 that a, the first term, is 3 plus 2i. And I know from the work I'm after doing that 1 minus 1i, the r to the power of 8, is actually 16. I've used the Moivre's theorem to work out that all of this to the power of 8 is just 16. So now I can simplify it, it's easy enough. It's simply 3 plus 2i multiplied by 16. And that is going to give me the ninth term in this geometric series. 16 times 3 is 48. 16 times 2i is 32i. And that's my final answer for B part 2.